Um, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this panel. Um, we'd like to start now. Uh, welcome, Damien. Can you hear us? Yes, perfect. Um, I so can welcome. hear you fine. Thank you. Great. Hello. Uh, so I would like to welcome all of you to this panel on uh, balancing uh, uh, individual rights and um, economic interests uh, in the European data strategy. Uh, the panel was organized by the Open Future uh, NGO, uh, which is a relatively new NGO working on uh, uh, data uh, commons and uh, digital public spaces. And uh, Alec Tarkovsky is, uh, is uh, one of the founding members. Paul Keller, who some of you might know uh, from the Creative Commons movement, is, uh, is another uh, uh, director of uh, this NGO. And we, uh, we started to think about um, how can we uh, ask the questions that the NGO is focusing on, uh, having some kind of a, a common public space around data uh, in a manner that fits uh, this uh, uh, conference. And um, so we started to reread uh, the digit European digital uh, the data strategy. And uh, it seems like this, not tech solutionist or like a blockchain solutionist uh, uh, manifesto, but like a data solutionist uh, manifesto that uh, only if we had access to better and more data, everything would be dandy. Like, and, uh, and I was reading the, the document again, uh, the words of Jeremy Bentham uh, came to my mind describing his invention of the panopticon. It's like, if we have this uh, architectural invention, morals would be uh, uh, reformed, the industry would be uh, invigorated, um, and so on and so on. So uh, I was, it was really uh, a, an interesting read. But uh, in practical terms, um, this um, uh, this issue um, like takes rather uh, different forms, uh, and within the strategy there are so many uh, issues that are being mentioned and also uh, 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 having access to data is being proposed as a solution that I couldn't even list all of them for myself. It's like cloud markets, global competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, US or China, data availability, governance, lack of trust, economic uh, imbalances, power imbalances, interoperability, tax sovereignty, uh, and also strong data subject rights. So it's like um, um, uh, um, a, a solution to everything or a strategy to address everything. Um, so there are many different uh, actions that have been envisaged in this strategy. Uh, and uh, one of those stand out maybe as, uh, as, as, uh, as the most uh, interesting or most relevant is, is the creation of these common data spaces. Uh, in strategic sectors within, within the EU, whether that's mobility or energy or the Green Deal or finance or public administration. And um, uh, like this strategy is from a, a number of years uh, ago. Uh, we are already in this process, uh, well into this process, uh, in, and all the acts that have been envisioned, envisioned in this uh, uh, strategy document are coming uh, uh, live. Uh, so uh, maybe in this uh, panel, what we'd like to do is to revisit a little bit one of these, a few of the assumptions and a few of the promises of the data strategy and um, have a fresh look at what has been achieved and what cannot be achieved and uh, uh, what kind of solutions uh, uh, we have come up with, uh, whether they are actually addressing the problems uh, or not. And one of the most important questions, at least for us, is whether this balancing act between economic interests and strong data subject rights is possible, or uh, whether, that, uh, uh, whether the current uh, proposed legislative frameworks are striking the right uh, balance. Um, <clears throat> so we have four questions uh, to, to ask. Um, One question is whether uh, the focus on economic aspects and competition undermined uh, the strong rights-based approach in the European data uh, policy framework. Uh, or put it in another way, uh, whether it's 
uh, whether a, a regulatory move away from a prohibition-based uh, uh, approach, which is more or less like the GDPR, which uh, has like thou shall not and thou shall types of rules. Uh, so this regulatory move into a, a more collaborative uh, uh, approach, where, which re relies on the cooperation of, of public and private sector actors to come up with data governance rules in these uh, horizontal uh, data spaces, is actually ach more, uh, uh, it's a better tool to actually achieve this balancing exercise uh, through this different regulatory approach. Um, and whether there is a value in, uh, uh, what's the value in that uh, uh, move? Uh, and in particular, the questions that I would like to ask the panelists to, uh, to discuss is, um, are the following. Uh, which measures uh, will have the most transformative potential on the market uh, uh, aspects of the uh, strategy? <coughs> what, where do you, and also I would like to involve the, the, uh, the audience, where do you think uh, the uh, current um, uh, uh, emerging regulatory frameworks may have the most impact on the business and economic um, uh, considerations or outcomes of this strategy. The second question is uh, that we are already in a few years into this process, and uh, so can we update our assessment of the drivers and obstacles of a data-driven innovation? Um, there is, of course, this uh, eternal um, dilemma whether more regulation stifles economic innovation or not, whether economic uh, uh, innovation and uh, more uh, or better protection of fundamental rights are in competition with each other. And maybe we are now in a better position to actually uh, think, rethink this issue and uh, find new answers. Uh, and also, maybe we are able to identify what are the and where are the points of conflict between uh, and rights and then economic uh, uh, fundamental rights and economic considerations, and whether uh, the um, U.S. EU China economic competition uh, is addressed uh, better addressed by. Uh, subjecting U.S. platforms to stringent European regulation. Uh, indifferent of the fact whether that leads to a stronger uh, European uh, business uh, innovative environment. Uh, so these are the questions for this panel and also for the audience. Uh, we have four uh, panel members. Uh, I would like to start from the far side. Uh, Helen Janssen is my colleague at the University of Amsterdam Institute for Information. Law. She has been working in uh, the Dutch public administration for more than a decade, and now she's researching on uh, data governance um, uh, issues. Um, Alek Tarkovsky is, as I said, uh, uh, the uh, funding member or funding director of Open Futures. Um, and a very, very long time uh, colleague in the Creative Commons movement. Lauren Lynn Hoot uh, is uh, the EU Government Affairs Director of Microsoft. And we have uh, a member of the European Parliament, Damian uh, Böselager. Uh, welcome all. Um, I'm going to leave this uh, uh, post here. I'm going to walk around uh, with a microphone. And what I ask from the panelists is to actually uh, keep it lively, keep it engaged, which also means that uh, the microphone or the floor will be open. Uh, during the whole panel. So if you just want to uh, interrupt or you have uh, something to say, just wave for me and I'm going to walk you there and give you a microphone for a, a brief uh, point or, or, or intervention. My name is Balaj Bodo. I'm a, uh, a professor at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, so let's start with the first question, um, which was, um, where do you expect uh, the most impact from the current uh, developments on like the economic uh, aspects of uh, of uh, of the data European data markets or data economy. Damien, do you want to start? I'm super happy to start, but also feel free to have a lively discussion amongst the people who are there in person. I think it's always easier to like bounce off of each other. I'll try to, to jump in also um, from further away. But uh, thanks a lot, first of all, for the invitation. Maybe just a super quick word of background. Um, I'm Damien. I used to work in the private sector and then 
uh, founded, uh, co-founded uh, European movement and uh, because I saw that there was right-wing populism rising across Europe and so we thought we built a European party. Um, so my perspective also uh, on the data markets is very much a perspective of a, uh, let's say, a startup. Um, so since I do consider my movement, um, Volt, to be a political startup, I very much also have a similar perspective on the barriers to entry and innovation capacities of the markets that we are currently looking at when we talk about the data economy. And um, I mean, you mentioned a lot of, uh, you know, different files and different, um, let's say, legislative proposals that have been coming along since the data strategy was presented by Breton. And um, I think it's worth like looking at the overall picture, but also then potentially um, looking at the more detailed ones that I work will work on. So I'll just do it super quick because I, I know it will just take too long if we if we cover the whole spectrum. But I mean. There are the big five, as we call them, which is the DMA, DSA, so Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act, um, and the AI Act. Um, and then there are two data files, Data Governance Act and the Data Act. And um, so I always worked it on the more data side of things. And I think it's also interesting to see that whereas um, Executive um, uh, Vice President uh, Vestager was more focused on the Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, and AI Act, which very much, especially the first to look at what happens if you have uh, markets that are already too concentrated, if there are gatekeepers that have too much power, how do we deal with this ex post and what kind of obligations do we put on them? And then now with the, on the data side, Breton came a bit later um, because the first candidate from the French uh, didn't make it and to become a pr commissioner of internal markets and said, look, we also need the data strategy. And that's where the commission's data strategy came from. And then from the parliament side, we answered also with our da own data strategy that I've been negotiating. And then there were two legislative acts, the Data Governance Act. Um, that's also one that I've been negotiating, which is more about how do you specify or like how do you regulate data stock exchanges, if you like, so neutral data markets, so we have a marketplace. And how do you now with the data act, that's the, the latest one that I'm currently working on, that's the latest commission proposal. How do you specify who's actually allowed to share data? And how does it work with industrial data? And just like one last word, if you ask me what's like the, you know, the, the most or the biggest uh, impact of, of all of these laws, I wouldn't be able to say they're all quite impactful. They really structure our data economy. Um, but uh, the one on the one that I'm working on, on the Data Act, the, the crucial question that we currently have, and I think which is very easily understandable for everyone, is if you buy a connected device, and that could be a car, or that could be um, you know a turbine, um, or that could be anything that you want with a sensor in it that is connected to the internet, who is able to do what with that data? Because currently, it's often the manufacturer slash the operator that is has de facto power over the data, even though they sold or long term leased uh, the connected device to someone else, be it another company or a customer, a private customer. Um, and that means they, they also uh, reap the benefits of the data that's being created by these connected devices. And what we're trying to do with the Data Act, and what I will really spend a lot of the next months uh, of my, my time and thinking on is how can you actually make this work in a, in a different way where you believe that um, like if you basically if you buy a device, if you operate it or like if you, let's say if you own a device, what kind of access rights should the manufacturer of that device have? But what kind of sharing rights should you also have as an owner of such a device, um, be it as a company or as an individual? And I think this will really structure the future data markets and, and give them a perspective on where to go. Um, my perspective here is, as I said in the beginning, um, always the one of how can we make a competitive data markets, liquid data markets, uh, where people can actually share and companies can share data. Um, and so that we have more innovative solutions out there, um, more competition and uh, yeah, more use of that data, if that makes sense. Sorry, the, the topic is very broad. I try to <laughs> make a you know, pick one specific topic that I, I think makes the most sense. I'm very interested to hear what the others have to say. Thank you. Uh, Laurelin, maybe uh, you have a, um, a more specific um, uh, answer because uh, Damian has mentioned so many industries. Maybe you have, um, you have a specific, specific industry perfect, uh, uh, perspective of where do you expect the, the most growth in which sector, which industry? Is it energy? Is it health? Is it mobility? Is it cloud? Is it, uh, is it something else? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Um, well, I um, 
uh, I will make a general answer to that one. Um, I think it's 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 those sectors that will manage um, to where we will manage. It it is not a specific sector. It's mm. really I believe it's really those sector that will manage to unlock the digital potential the soonest. Data access is, is I think very important. Like mm. how 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 um, how how accessible is the data? Um, you know, the, the Commission is doing work on the Open Data Directive and so on for, for, for public sector use, but also in other sectors, it's, 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 it's really important. And some sectors are quicker in taking that up than others. For example, the manufacturing sector is clearly an example where that takes very swift uh, um, pace. Um, I think, apart from data access, um, we do believe in data spaces. Um, because that's really, uh, we really see them data spaces where you allow uh, um, many intervenants to participate. It's really like, I, I would like to see it as a laboratory, right? It's an, an, an experiment zone and you can really create an, uh, an ecosystem where you see that people are stimulated to, um, to develop new services, new products and um, it's sometimes there is a lot of fa failure and error, of course. But if it works, then um, it can be really successful. That is, for example, why we why we believe in an uh, initiative like Gaia X, where it's really a trial and error of trying to sit together with industry players, with other players, stakeholders, researchers, and so on, to to come to an agreement about <coughs> what can we do and also how can we do it. Because these discussions about interoperability and exchanging uh, data, they take a lot of time and they are very much, um, sometimes it's, there there is a lot of detail there, of course, as well. And then maybe um, two more points. Um, I think uh, these data spaces will work also if we manage to have the right governance mechanisms, not only on privacy and security, but also on, on, on elements like how do we exchange data, the data formats, the data objects, the definitions. So that's why we very strongly believe in standardization uh, in, an, in an open and inclusive way. We believe that the exercise should be done. Uh, but it's it's very important to to make that work, and maybe a last point, which I think you have not mentioned even, is skills. We will in all of the sectors, uh, we will. I mean, the access to skills will be will be key, and uh, allowing that, for example, AI AI talents, but also generally data talents are well distributed a lot among the economy is 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 we believe is key. Okay. Um, Helene, let me turn to you because you have been uh, you have been studying and also practicing the uh, one particular segment of this whole problem space, and that is how uh, the, the the role of the public sector in this whole data economy, both as a source of data for the uh, businesses, but also as a potential user of like business data or private sector data. So, do you think that uh, the the pub do you think that there will be a boom? or a boon for the public sector uh, uh, as a result of, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of these changes or upcoming like, legislations? Yeah, um, so whether it creates opportunities for the public sector. Uh, I think there are aspects um, where, uh, where, let's say, uh, what the government or what the public sector stands for in their relationship with citizens and consumers is um, that uh, have where they might enable people to to get to gain more control over their data and the data processing. Um, I think that these are uh, areas where um, uh, fundamental rights might be better protected, but there are a lot of buts here under the condition indeed that there is a robust data governance. And this uh, may have to be created uh, also in cooperation with the public sector um, and also public sector telling uh, how fundamental rights can be complied with because we are not only talking about um, uh, privacy data protection but also potential uh, biases leading to discrimination or um, uh, data governance that might um, I create problems uh, with other fundamental rights, such uh, as expressional freedom that we have seen over uh, the past uh, years. Um, 
So there are opportunities, um, and I can elaborate on them later, but where I see a big problem in this, uh, particularly in the Data Act, is where uh, B2G data sharing is really, um, yeah, uh, it's, it, it's brought to almost no possibility for B2G data sharing, and I think that's a missed opportunity. Um, of course, we must be very critical uh, about uh, public sector using uh, um, private sector data. But at the same time, uh, we also see that uh, public sector uh, is tasked with uh, a lot of uh, roles vis-a-vis uh, -vis society, individuals, society at large. Um, and there are opportunities uh, for the public sector that uh, I'm not yet talking about the governance, but um, for now, the Data Act says you can only uh, access um, as, a, as a public sector uh, private, pri privately held data uh, whenever there's a, an urgent, uh, when, when there's an emergency. And then we are talking about serious emergencies. Um, and there are so many opportunities, I think, where better evidence-based policymaking could profit from privately held data. And I'm not so going to say this is an easy exercise. There's a lot of trust, confidentiality. How does a government, what does it want? Is it necessary for a government to, to, to get access to these privately held data? If there is no necessity, well, I would say nearly all national constitutions say, the European Convention of Human Rights says, and we also have uh, the, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms. They say, unless there is a necessity, which is of a lower bar, um, you cannot uh, access to people's data, you cannot access, you cannot uh, just infringe upon uh, legitimate rights. So if you want access to these data as a government or as a public sector, you must find a basis in the law or create a basis in the law. And such access should be proportionate and should respect all rights and interests involved. Also, the rights and interests of, co of companies, of course. So, Can I ask, uh, can I ask on this? Sure. Um, since we, we are asked to, to jump in. Sure. Um, so, just, uh, so I have to write my you know, amendments on this specific paragraph, obviously, as well in, in the law. Um, and I mean, what I hear from the business side is, look, you can, as a public sector, if there's no emergency, obviously also buy that data off us at fair market prices. So why shouldn't you, you know, if there's no time pressure, not, uh, you know, pay for the value that has been created um, with, with the price that is the market price and nobody will, you know, uh, you know stop you from, from doing that. Um, that's the one side. And the, on the other side, I see in the German coalition contract, for example, um, the Greens and the Social Democrats and um, Liberals actually wrote that, you know, data should be uh, yeah, basically requestable by the public sector on much lower grounds, so more in your direction. So, I mean, do, do you know what kind of circumstance or do you have an example of what kind of circumstance would not create an emergency? but would still require the governments to be able to force uh, uh, businesses to transfer the data to them and that they can't buy it. So uh, what are the use cases that we're actually talking about between emergency and a uh, normal you know, uh, purchase on, on the open markets? Yeah, sure. Um, well, actually, I'm uh, conducting research for the city of Amsterdam. Uh, and Amsterdam is uh, pretty much ahead in thinking of, well, how can we cooperate with all those entities that are doing things in our public space. So um, the, the, the government, the, the, the municipality has, uh, has asked us, well, are there um, ways and manners in which we can also, yeah, get, or get access to uh, pub privately held data, mostly sensor data that was collected in public space? So we're not talking about smartphone data or, or that kind of stuff. Um, so, what would be a, a, a use case? Well, we are looking very much into the mobility sector because uh, there's much data is collected in this uh, mobility sector by several types of actors. So, yeah, you have the bus company, you might have a metro company, you have a train company, uh, you have scooters uh, that are uh, dropped uh, across public spaces. And all these companies, they're uh, collecting data about the public space. And this is particularly where 
the municipality says, hey, we can learn something from this because we know where, where it's very busy. And maybe as a government or as a public, um, yeah, as a public sector, we have to say, hey, maybe we should make the, 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 the cycle road a bit broader because it seems that there are many of those scooters on the way from, from this point in the city to another point in the city. Let's make this safer. And this is uh, also from a fundamental rights perspective is where, uh, where the public sector has a role to play. It's not only that they have to withheld from people's fundamental rights, but they also have to, um, they, also, they are also to obli uh, obliged to, to take care of people's needs and, and safety and security in this manner. So um, yeah, this is an example that was brought uh, to us by, uh, by one of the companies. So there are opportunities uh, for cooperation or even shared interests if you, if you want. Um, so, yeah, just as a start, I think that's a, that, might, that might be a use case. Yeah, and maybe we can get back to this question of like, uh, is the market functioning? Because uh, for the last two years, I've been yeah. listening to stories again and again and again where uh, private companies are reluctant to share data uh, because it gives them business advantage or because it would uh, disadvantage them in labor disputes or uh, stuff like that. So there, uh, assuming that there is market there, uh, it's a very strong assumption. Uh, but be before we get there, I would like to uh, ask Alec to actually uh, 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 introduce us a little bit whether there is this third space between the private business-to-business uh, uh, -business data sharing and the, the public, the government, or the municipality uh, uh, trying to uh, create a, a data space around itself, uh, whether data commons or digital public spaces are, are a third space, or they are a mix of these two, or, or, or there is a new opportunity for something which may reflect uh, the the public domain as in copyright and the intellectual property. Uh, Very property quickly production. on the B2G data sharing matter, and I think it's mm. totally related to, to this bigger question. I don't think the price is an issue, and we know this from open data. It's a big question. I would put it in this question we have coming up of barriers. Obviously, we know that pricing schemes uh, affect, right, whether it's marginal cost or not. It's, it's not to be belittled. It's a big issue. But in the end, I think the question is, as you say, whether there is, let's say, a market. And I think that's the issue that the Data Act is trying to fix, that actually when companies say you can buy the data from us, the evidence suggests that in many cases, actually, you cannot buy it for mm -hmm. any price. Um, so, but, but looking at the bigger picture, what's interesting for me, and, and I look at these element of the data strategy where I would say it's breaking away from market orthodoxy. There are things in new acts that I think would not have happened under the digital market strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, for this reason, uh, also at this conference, when I hear people mention in sort of, they say DMA, DSA, and usually they stop, I would really like to hear data act because I think uh, as you say it, so you said the uh, data solution is manifesto. It is a manifesto. There's one sentence there that I really like. It says, and it doesn't sound like a start of a regulatory document, it says the winners of today will not necessarily be the winners of tomorrow. <laughs> and now, of course, what's interesting for me is that this, uh, to many people, means like market competition. To me, the question is, as you said, can we try to imagine completely new kinds of winners? And, and the category that I think we can latch on here is collective rights. Um, I know it's a, I mentioned it because I know also among privacy scholars, it's now a big debate uh, on collective versus individual framing of privacy, but I think it goes beyond privacy. And basically ideas around B2G data sharing, I think when you fully think about them, they, they come to this idea of collective rights, collective rights in data, uh, or collective management of data. We just uh, published yesterday a, a policy brief on public data commons. Um, Maybe it's worth mentioning there's also one thing that didn't happen that's very relevant. So the commission didn't go for a property-based model uh, in the data market. It's a huge thing. We have a 25 years history of the database directive, which is a dead end. We have five years of policy documents preparing us for this idea that we'll need property rights to be able to do things like the B2B data sharing proposal. There was a real risk that that will be the model. By the way, lack of property rights doesn't mean lack of markets, right? You can still monetize uh, access, but not based on ownership. Um, and, and I think that that's one more thing I would highlight as something that's not there, but, but is really relevant, uh, as I said, living in this sort of post-DSM uh, era. Okay, so uh, still, uh, the, the, then the question, uh, 
uh, is still like uh, is this new model of uh, of uh, new approach to the governance of data, whether that's uh, this um, uh, let's have access, let's provide more access or more opportunities to have access for the public sector to actually uh, uh, create these uh, these. Um, data clouds or data infrastructures which are more which are closer to the public and also in the data governance act uh, create these uh, frameworks where data controllers uh, uh, are required to collaborate right uh, on rules uh, on the norms on the infrastructures of like data sharing uh, and have to think together of how they are gonna build these uh, uh, these spaces which are beyond the individual uh, uh, control or the, the denial of access uh, type of approach of innovation. So is, is this actually a model where, which we can expect uh, to take place? And I'm, I'm, I'm try, I would like to stress this uh, because uh, uh, this question and again and again and again is like, apart from providing the frameworks, the regulatory frameworks, what are the institutional or economic uh, 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 obstacles or hurdles uh, which are still there? And I know, Helen, that you've been uh, asking these questions from, uh, from uh, private uh, parties and also from the, uh, from the uh, municipality in Amsterdam. It's like, why is why is there no market there, or what are the what are the non-legal uh, obstacles to uh, these things happening by themselves? So, uh, I don't know if you have any information or any knowledge on uh, like what are what is the institutional uh, structure behind uh, this, and whether we can whether we should expect uh, it to change uh, just because we have uh, now the Data Act and the Data Governance Act. Um. Yeah, so uh, some interesting uh, perspectives. Uh, I think, uh, well, what we wanted to do in this uh, particular research with Amsterdam was to build uh, a case study. And for that, I started to interview people from businesses active in Amsterdam and uh, people from, uh, from the municipality. And nobody uh, wanted to, uh, <laughs> to, to talk uh, uh, on an open basis, so they all wanted to be anonymized and were very, very careful. So that, that means there are huge interests at stake here, at least as felt by the, people's, the people we interviewed. Um, that in itself is already an interesting uh, uh, point, I think. Um, uh, what are the things uh, holding companies back, let's say, uh, the companies back in uh, sharing data? Well, uh, commonly, uh, heard things are like well uh, we are we are afraid that our business model will be on the street once we start sharing and we don't know what the municipality is going to do with it more exactly mm. that is a, a legitimate uh, concern uh, because it, it, these rights should be protected also by the government whenever whenever they get access to it but yeah, the question is well okay the law is there but once they have some data from us uh, will they actually take care I mean had a the risk that things go wrong, uh, yeah, is there. Mm -hmm. And particularly also, uh, they notice, for instance, that not every uh, civil servant is that tax heavy, that they, are know, <laughs> that they know what they're doing with and, and what the value of the, of the data is. So there's this concern. We heard concerns about um, uh, uh, data protection uh, rights or personal data being not properly protected. But the point is actually that uh, the, the, the municipality doesn't want to receive personal data. They want to receive data aggregate. My point is then, well, even in data aggregate, there can be personal data. So you should always maybe treat it as it were personal data. And we also know that anonymization techniques, uh, they have their limitations, so uh, there are a lot of concerns here. Um, and then uh, there is also, uh, particularly in pu public uh, or in the semi-public sector, there are questions around, well, who is, who's the boss over the data and, and do I have to share it actually? So you, may, you might say that this is a transport company. It's a private company, but um, and, and they say, well, hey, we are operating for the public, but we have rights over the data that that uh, relate to private companies so it's incredibly um it, it it's difficult and so uh, are we talking about uh, public space or are we talking about spaces where uh, private parties are regulating something in public space so 
just to mention a couple of things that once you start to think about uh, data governance, these are all aspects and it's a huge and, and, and complex field that you have to regulate. And once you don't do this in a proper manner, then, then hey, if you don't deal with data in a confidential manner, uh, then uh, the, the trust of the parties involved that might, might fly away. So uh, trust comes uh, um, on foot and, and, and goes on horse. Uh, so these are things that, yeah, that come with uh, data governance, I would say, m most naturally. Damien, if I may address you, um, in the legislative process, you're probably talking to like uh, all kinds of uh, stakeholders in, uh, in this process. And uh, um, so for you, the, the question would be the same as for, that was for Helen. It's like, what is your impression, uh, different industry stakeholders, uh, what are the, the, the biggest concern uh, and how do they expect the, uh, these legislative uh, instruments to address those? So first of all, I think when it comes to the um, business to uh, yeah, business to government um, data sharing, uh, very much like what Helen uh, just ended with, which is the idea of saying, okay, what about data that's collected in public spaces, and how do we, you know, differentiate that? I have to say that I'm on this part and actually on the whole law still considering what the best options are. But if you ask me what the other stakeholders say, obviously. They would say, like, look, it costs us money to generate that data. Um, so why should we just, you know, transfer this for free to anyone, be it uh, the government or any other client? And that is a, I mean, the question. Maybe we can also differentiate between emergency situations and then maybe the necessity or obligation to sell, not to give for free, but to sell uh, to at, at fair prices to governments um, if there are public spaces involved. This is just brainstorming, and yeah? we have to consider and uh, debate and think about what makes sense. Um, but I also like what Eric said about the question of, you know, um, who will be the winners? And I think this is, uh, for me, still the biggest, um, if you want to call it obstacle, you could, but I'm quite <laughs> surprised, similar to Alec, how little people understand, I, I, would, I don't want to say the severity, but like the, you know, the, let's say, implications that the Data Act will have on our data economy and who will be the winners. Because I learned a new uh, term, which is the de facto legal control. And currently, the de facto legal control of most data uh, or most data sets, data points, lies with the manufacturer of a connected device. Why? Because they just, you know, they have the software and the server where this data is going, and so they have the database, and then they basically just uh, hold that data. And I mean. If we really think this um, this data act in a new way, it could mean that basically we transfer this power to share data and to uh, you know like bring it on a platform and, and do and even give it to the government or to do with it whatever um, to the user of a device, and that's really taking it away from the de facto legal control that currently lies with the with the manufacturer or operator, and that is a quite a, se a severe. Um, let's say a step to take, and then obviously uh, the user of that device could sell that data, um, or the right of a data flow. You could call it even licensing over time or whatever, um, back to to man the manufacturer or any third party. But this is a rethinking of our data economy. And if you actually look at the global debate, I'm not so much in the academic, but in the regulators' debate. Um, you f see a different model in India where they think more about techno-legal protocols to somehow, you know, organize that. And in uh, South America, they think about other, you know, more open data uh, uh, focus. And so, I mean, this is really, uh, I think, a crucial um, question of what our future data markets will look like. And that's also means actually how value is being distributed amongst bigger companies, smaller companies and consumers, if you want. Um, and so. Uh, if you ask me what's the biggest obstacle when it comes to the Data Act, I think it is rethinking in our minds what the data economy will look like. Uh, that's really like the, yeah. uh, the, the big point. And uh, that's why it's also for me at the moment super interesting to be on several different panels. You have said it. I've uh, actually just today I spoke to industry representatives. Um, last week I spoke to a range of um, uh, yeah, law professors on data law and I think and, and even property law. Uh, this has also been mentioned, and I think it's just a, a super interesting point right now to, to to imagine together what we want value to be shared or like how we want value to be shared across uh, the society. Can I add to this again a bit coming back to collective rights and, and to users whom you mentioned, Damian? I think there's a 
obstacle regarding our imagination. So when I hear that business making an argument, basically it's our data, let's say you're the owner of the, that fleet of scooters, I would go like, <clears throat> someone was riding that scooter, right? It doesn't exactly. ride on its own. And even it's, it's interesting that the proposal concerns IoT because for IoT, you cannot make the argument you're paying with your data for a service that's free. Right, there's a payment either for renting the device or, or for buying it, which I think really changes the narrative and the debate that we're having. And we really need to put these users in the picture, which is hard. I mean, you, I think citizens will not do it themselves. These are pretty complex issues. We have the whole story of data portability and the GDPR, which is not working for multiple reasons. Uh, I think basically no one tried hard enough to make it work and some hard, tried hard to stop it. Um, and the question is whether this will be fixed because basically some of these ideas around the B2B data sharing is like that data portability on steroids, but with the same risks, right? And there's also interesting questions. I basically understand formally it's an individual right but it will be sort of aggregated right by the way same idea behind data intermediaries and 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 there's some trick there around how that aggregation will happen there are ideas that it should be around collectives commons but there are also ideas that basically it should be monetized relationships conducted basically by market intermediaries um, i think it's very interesting in general i think data act is not uh, sufficiently perceived as the moment where some ideas that until now were theoretical or very fringe. You know, data cooperatives, there's a recent Harvard study that found, I think, three serious ones or 13, right, all over Europe. Uh, and now we have a regulation that puts some framework to scale it. Um, and, and so I'm hoping we'll see some of ideas that were for now stuck, let's say, in legal papers on, or some fringe experiments that maybe, I don't know, Mozilla funded, uh, really hopefully roll out. Uh, Laurelin, I, I don't know if I can address you not uh, uh, simply, uh, like I can imagine Microsoft having like multiple uh, uh, stakes in this uh, transformation. One is of course the infrastructure provider for other uh, industries. Uh, one uh, that is like, which I would like to address is like uh, as one of the giants in the data economy which controls, collects, controls large chunks of data, all kinds of data from, uh, from very wide economic transactions from search to uh, cloud usage to, uh, to uh, uh, transatlantic data flows to devices, uh, geolocation, whatnot and also a potential of, um, of a data intermediary, which I would like to get back to as a, uh, as a topic in a, in a minute. But, uh, but before that, I would like to ask you, uh, is, uh, like how enthusiastic Microsoft is uh, about like, uh, being like, the one who has data and now has the opportunity to share data to with us? To share that? it, yeah. great. <laughs> no, we like data sharing, but I would like to make a nuance because you made a distinction between infrastructure and uh, cloud, you, 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 in a, a cloud provider is not meant to, is, is not a cloud, con is, is not a data controller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we know. we yeah. are a processor, so yeah. um, we've, there is, I wouldn't say that the data act is super crystal clear on that point, whether uh, a cloud provider can be a data holder, but our reading is that we are not a data holder as a cloud provider, so. Uh, could, it could it could merit some imp some clarification there, uh, but um, we are actually <laughs> we, we discussed this earlier. I think okay. it's it's unclear because it says um, the ability to share, which is not clear enough, and I think it, uh, that that actually means uh, the controller it shouldn't be you. Yeah. Indeed, but in the big scheme of things, uh, we are absolutely in favor of data sharing and also in operability interoperability, which we think is important, and. Um, when looking at some successful use cases, like if, for example, I mentioned the, the manufacturing industry, mm -hmm. um, you, you have the, the use case that is called Katina X, where, whereby you have many players in the, old, in the, manu in, in the car manufacturing industry that um, have started sharing their d data according to plus. You see similar use cases in, in ports, for example. In the port of Antwerp, there is a case called Nextport. In the port of Rotterdam, mm -hmm. there is another one. It, it's logistics, and, and, and you see that the, um, uh, the participants have very much the same, like similar interests yeah. and, and similar mindset and similar culture. And there, it, it really uh, works. What we do see is that these companies struggle with um, 
for example, setting up model contract clauses. So mm -hmm. I think that, that there could be um, uh, progress in, 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 in proposing voluntary model, model clauses. Another thing that, that is really a struggle is to define interoperability formats, how, how, and that's really very granular, and it takes a lot of time before, before parties uh, agree on that. Um, and, and, and I think generally also what is still a struggle, and I, I, it's important to make the right balance, obviously, between, between privacy and, um, and, and, and data sharing, we have said it many times, but still, many companies still are very much afraid of they have reservations because the, the, the framework is unclear. Can they, is, is this encryption enough? Is differential, differential, differential privacy enough? What, what mechanism can we use to make the data anonymous and all of that? So that, I, I think that more, if we could maybe come to clearer guidance in that regard, it would, it would help a lot in the concrete use cases, we think. Whose task is this to, um, and this is my turn to, to the data, data governance uh, issues or the data intermediaries issues, it's like, uh, who are you looking to, uh, to define those rules? Is it the, the, the role of the legislator? Is it the role of uh, some enforcement agency, competent relevant national agency? Is it the, uh, is it the task of those industry players who have to sit down and, and, um, and uh, think, okay, we are all browser providers. We're gonna start sharing information with each other because we want to limit the spread of misinformation yeah. because it's a shared interest. It's, right? it's a great question and I think it will be a mixture personally. Uh, because, I mean, each data space has somehow to define its own mm -hmm. rules. You cannot have the same rules in a health data space and in a car manufacturing data space. They, there must be differences, of course. The data is also different. So, uh, but, but then again, I, I do think that in terms of interoperability standards, like bodies like um, the, the recognized standardization bodies, like ISO and so, um, I mean, they have already done work in that. We could probably build on that and improve it. We, we think that, so we, uh, it's, it's a mixture between government guidance, where certainly the, gov the, yeah. the, the, the privacy regulators, the commission, they can, uh, they can certainly give guidance, standards, and then I think also private, private agreements. There will be a mixture, I think. Just very quickly, I think, and interoperability is probably a topic for a separate session, but, but what I find interesting there is um, there's some struggle around the idea of open standards, which in principle is a great idea and should be a great idea, but I think by now we know that open standards can also be captured by dominant players. And, and there seems to be a lot of still ambiguity around the uh, common data spaces. Basically, as far as I understand them, we know by now they need to be interoperable in the in broadest sense of this term, which I think can, as you said, mean different things in different sectors. And for now, no one's really trying to go into too many details and they leave it at it's complicated. Um, and what else do we know? That there won't be an operator. So that suggests, um, basically some, some kind of self-regulation, I guess, by the market. On the other hand, the Data Act has some new language on, on, on what will be the procedures for interoperability. So I think that would be one more interesting thing to pay attention to. It's, it's the framework might be good, but in practice, how, whether these interoperable rules will really translate into interoperable and fair, therefore, in level markets, I think it, it cannot be prescribed. Can I come back? Oh, my, Helen first, and then I'll go after. Sorry. Go ahead. I think. Uh, yeah. That okay. Is, I think um, yeah. Just very. Uh, so we are now talking about uh, pretty much uh, ex ante uh, perspectives. So where you uh, discuss and, and regulate things uh, uh, for, for when things go wrong, but you might also look at the. Uh, sorry, the ex post uh, pers uh, perspective, but you might also look at ex ante impact assessments. Uh, very much tailored to maybe the sector uh, where these should apply. So I think the, one of the biggest, uh, yeah, and also having worked as a, as a legislator, uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges is, well, operating and, and developing things um, with the stakeholders on board, uh, right between uh, the, the 
the, the abstract level and the very concrete level because you really have to go case by case and each organization will entail its own uh, culture and, and difficulties and, and, and interests. So, yeah, maybe thinking of yeah, an, such an ex anti um, mechanism that might help at least taking the next steps. It will not be the silver bullet, but um, it seems now like uh, have people are waiting on the line and say, well, this is not enough, this is not enough. Um, so it might be an extra element to, to try and carve out how the proposed uh, regulation might work or not work, actually. Yeah, I want to come uh, in on a very similar point, um, which is the question I think that, that both of you just mentioned, which is, you know, who defines uh, what kind of interoperability standards, uh, you know, should prevail. Um, and I think in the beginning, Gaia X was also mentioned, and, and Gaia X uh, does create, you know, the, the yeah, like a model for some, even though Gaia X is a name for many different initiatives by now, I think, but like. Um, does create some standards on interoperability potential uh, between databases and uh, potentially also applications. Um, but GAIA-X has a governance structure that also expresses its interests. And you can you can see that if you actually look at uh, GAIA-X, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, it's just a reality. And I think Helen also has also mentioned that. Um, if you, I think, think about how standards are developed, you should always have that in mind. Who uh, is actually developing them and how? Uh, what is the process open to ensure that smaller companies, which normally don't have, you know, two or three or even 50 engineers ready to, to help, uh, you know, co-draft the standard, are they also represented in a fair and, and, and good way? And um, I mean, it's also true that international standardization agencies, when it comes to the digital space and data formats, um, are, have, very often have at the moment, uh, yeah, companies more from uh, yeah, from China, the US at the forefront, very often also Europeans, but like, so these are just realities that we should be aware of. And then to Alex's point, uh, yes, um, it's true that the commission basically now gave it, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a, a potential stick approach. So basically, uh, what the Data Act does, it, it requires interoperability at least for, for um, infrastructure as a service, not for platform as a service. So let's say the, the lower level of sophistication of cloud service provision. Um, and uh, I think if basically cloud service providers would not follow and or not develop some form of interoperable standard and allow for um, the switching easily, then the commission retains the right to come forward with an implementing act to actually, which means basically the commission just writing um, like a very yeah, uh, specific uh, legislation, legislation if you want, or specification of the law, which would enable the commission to basically set the standard. Um, but I think it's actually good to let the industry first try to develop it and then see how this works. Obviously, infrastructure as a service is, uh, you know, is, is not a, it's not going to help so much, but it's also almost impossible, or at least I have to still think about it, how you could make um, platforms as a service more interoperable, which is uh, definitely more complicated. Yeah. Go ahead. If I may, yeah. <laughs> I, I fully uh, subscribe to your uh, plea for um, having um, open and inclusive processes in terms of standard setting and also having the industry involved. Um, I, 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 I agree with you that the presence of SMEs is also is, is key. Yet, I'm, I'm, this is like not an, an excuse or so something that I'm trying to find. It's just that those discussions are extremely time and labor intensive. Mm -hmm. And sometimes SME are simply not, it's not like there is an attempt to exclude them, but sometimes there is, they are not organized to, to do that kind of work. So there, there is also a reality there. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I also like the approach you described it, that, the, the, that you see that in the Data Act, the, they will first be given room to industry and only when that fails, uh, the commission can act. Yet I do think it's maybe not that clear. <laughs> I, so maybe something to look at also. Which, which by the way is really interesting, you know, in the DMA debate that was just finalized, that was such a huge thing, the, the conversation on, intermi on interoperability of, of the largest platforms, in the end it was limited to messaging services. And here we suddenly have potentially, you know, interoperability of, of really broad spaces. Similarly, it's okay, it's more described as portability, but the IoT provisions, they by the way include um, virtual assistants, 
which in my book gets like really close to social networks, right, to dominant platforms, with these kind of frameworks mm -hmm. that, of course, it's not prescribed, right? But but there is always the sense that the commission might come in, and 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 describe the the shape of interoperability. I think it's it's very interesting. Um, but this capacity issue, that's a whole different thing, right? It's almost a different conversation, but it also seems as if, you know, we like to say we are by now data-driven societies, but mm -hmm. actually these frameworks, which actually once they're written, it doesn't sound like science fiction, right? It's, it's not that science fiction, but it sounds like quite complicated bureaucracy, and you mentioned exactly. SMEs, but the same point can be made. Yeah. The, their wonderful vision of citizen or participatory governance of data, but imagine that in practice being tasked as a citizen, I think you know, in in some jurisdictions, they're um, not on the continent, right? But but in the UK, you can be uh, basically drawn into a jury, and that's hard work. I think it's easier work to be a judge than to be a data commissioner, mm. uh, and we might face a reality where <laughs> we're asked to do that on a weekend. Yeah, this is exactly like my my uh, if if you like my concern is that um, like I in the last. A uh, couple of years, I've, I've, um, I've uh, looked at uh, quite, quite a lot uh, with this Web 3.0 blockchain-based governance efforts, also in the data governance uh, domain, but also in the general how do we govern each other uh, or ourselves with these technological tools, and uh, this uh, this research has given me like two like warnings. One is that um, uh, that even if you create a very nice uh, technical technical infrastructure for data sharing or for governance, that doesn't mean that all the other components are there which would uh, incentivize various stakeholders to actually use that system. So even if you create a really nice framework, uh, that framework is just one element in that, uh, in that larger uh, ecosystem. And, uh, and the second is that, uh, yeah, governance is a very time and, um, and, uh, and resource intensive uh, project. And even if you create all these uh, opportunities for people to participate and to vote and consider and deliberate, uh, most of them will not have the power, the, uh, the willingness, the time, the energy, the knowledge, the resources, the skills to actually like, want to be involved. And then we end up with the, with the re-centralization of power on the one hand, or just the abandonment of nice infrastructures, because like, it's, it's, uh, it's not addressing as, uh, maybe more important or, or other factors that play uh, play into a uh, thing. And, and I would like to like get back to... I think we had a question. Oh, also. sorry. That, that yeah. person. There. One, two. Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to say, I forgot. Thank you. Uh, that uh, the floor is open. So please, uh, one here, one there. Uh, Kasia. Yeah, thank you. Um, I haven't read, I tried reading a Data Act, I, but I haven't managed to understand it fully, so I would be really grateful for and the panel helping me imagine a use case, especially, especially as Alex signaled uh, with regard to dominant players. So imagine somebody doing Fitbit type of device or, or assistant and maybe a group of users people who maybe get together even for some kind of data cooperative and they want to not only trans tr transport the data somewhere else like alternative product but uh, start using that data for their own benefit. Maybe even uh, they found somebody who is willing to based on that data develop like uh, an algorithm that will analyze data for them. Would a use case like this be possible in your opinion under the Data Act? And if not, what are the barriers? Specifically, I have noted one line there saying that you cannot, uh, you cannot take the data to the place where it will be used for competitive purpose. And I wonder how, to, how that will be interpreted um, in practice. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to uh, give an idea on this. So I think it's interesting to understand what the Commission proposed and uh, also what the discussion that we just had is about. So what the Commission proposes is, in this, uh, and this is really the first chapters of the Data Act, is that you, as in general, devices, connected devices should be built in a way that you can directly access the data. And then later on it says, if that is somehow not possible for the connected device, and this in brackets means that the company should show that it's not easily possible, maybe because there's not enough uh, you know, um, space on the chip or whatever, 
um, then the device should be built, or like the, the, the service should be built in a way that you, um, as a owner of that device, can ask the manufacturer to transfer this data to a third party. And your question was very precise on, you know, how, what kind of uh, use cases does that now entail? Um, and I think they very much think that you basically, uh, or that the manufacturer holds the data as data holder, um, and then basically like the Fitbit company is the, has the majority of the data and they can do with it whatever they want. Um, whereas you can only ask to either download the data or have it transferred to, to a third party, but the third party, as you said, is not allowed to build a competitive offering. And here is, I think, where I personally see the philo philosophy of the market completely differently. And this was about the point of Alec, you know, who is going to be the winner of, of the new data economy. For me, the assumption holds that if you use that Fitbit and you bought that device, the data that it produces is first and foremost yours. I would not say it should be a data ownership model because you could also say that the Fitbit manufacturer should have access to the data to improve their service. Yeah, you could have data access rights. But when it comes to the data sharing, and that's your question, I think there should be as little limitations as possible mm -hmm. because you get raw data. And that raw data is produced by you. Uh, you're running with that device. And if you want to share this with whomever, I think that should be possible. And then some of the manufacturers come to me and say, yeah, but like, what about the trade secrets entailed in the raw data that, it's being, that is being, you know, produced and here I don't really buy it. As I said, I mean, I was in the private sector before uh, with a consulting firm and what we did is we took hardware, so cars and other devices, and we cut them in the smallest possible pieces to try to understand competitors. You can say this is, you know, illegal or whatever, but like it's being done with hardware all, like at, all the time and you can see this happening and that's why we have IP rights and they, the IP rights safeguard that you don't just, you know, use the, the thought, thoughts of somebody else. Um, but it also means that you know the, the company who's best at producing this amazing hardware will be the one that, that will be succeeding. And I think if you're good enough to restructure and reorganize the raw data to offer a competitive service to the one that the Fitbit uh, you know producer that has actually originally produced that device, I mean, good for you. Yeah, I think it should be really clear that um, it is the right of the end user to share this data in a data cooperative, which we organized in the Data Governance Act, with many other, you know, Fitbit users, and uh, and sell this data also if they want to, once it's anonymized, uh, to to um, some other competitor to get a better service. Yeah. And uh, sorry to just make this very clear, it means you should have the the option of just having your data, sorry, your Fitbit operated by another competitor that already exists, and that should be possible. And it should be possible for you to share this data on any form of platform of data intermediary together with data cooperatives to potentially allow for different uses that, that could still come up. I mean, be it the public sector information about where people are running or something else. If I can just quickly say to me that part about uh, competition is super confusing. I mean, if that was kept in the DMA, then the messaging service could be interoperable, I don't know, with what, with a scooter, right? Instead of another messaging network. It, it, it really, the logic is not clear other than just to make it more acceptable, I guess, to big market players whom you can say, well, at least this won't feed the competition. But I think from a logic of, of the market or even this, these broader markets where I would like to see cooperatives, I would like to see non-market players, I would like to see public entities. Uh, I agree with you, Damian, it, it, uh, we shouldn't put such limitations, I think, in place. Just one more point, there's trade secrets, uh, the trade secret directive, and that's an interesting issue because we will discuss this also a lot uh, within Parliament, because trade secrets can be defined by the company themselves, yeah? so they could potentially withhold certain data saying that this is trade secret, um, but it's unclear because the governance of how to define a trade secret is not so uh, you know, public, so there are issues that we need to look at. Sorry to, to build on that. Hello, thank you for the debate. I think uh, the core question is about sovereignty uh, of our data in Europe. I think we have to keep in mind uh, Gaia X, for example, uh, you, you gave uh, one moment. It's uh, for, for European uh, cloud providers. I think it's important to, to keep that in mind. So, what about uh, our uh, sovereignty in Europe for our data? Thank you. I can try, but I don't know. I see Damien. You want to go first. Go first. 
I mean, I, I just find it extremely funny because I uh, have a committee that's fight with Commissioner Breton constantly about European sovereignty in the digital sphere uh, versus European competitiveness. And I have to say that, like, I, I don't fully understand that word sovereignty. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, I understand it more and more when it comes to potentially health, uh, you know, devices like masks and uh, like, you know, potentially food. Maybe I've gotten a bit more, you know, in this direction of, of, of sovereignty or autarky or whatever you want to. But still, there, I'm even uh, like still cautious. But for me, it doesn't matter where you come from and where you go as long as you um, follow the European rules, you should be able to act and compete on the European uh, market. And the only exclusion criteria is if you don't follow uh, the European rules or we, you, we can't enforce that the, you follow the European rules. But this is what we want, a, a full competition independent of, of where you come from and this kind of more protectionist approach I don't in itself approve. I think we can discuss whether, for example, American companies, if they are forced under the Cloud Act to provide data to the CIA, whether we find that uh, you know problematic or not, and that's a whole Schrems discussion and, and the whole data adequacy under GDPR. But the sovereignty itself um, is, some, is a weird and a bit foreign concept yeah. to me. Sorry for the strong re reaction. If I may complete. I think that sovereignty is a very um, multifaceted word, right? You have, um, you have, uh, as, as, as Damien said, you have um, concerns about security, data sovereignty, uh, human rights, building up of Europe's own capacities, and many of these layers are in the word sovereignty. So I think many people will also have a different understanding about sovereignty. And I, wh what we currently see in Europe is. Um, like we are sitting here on a debate uh, about how to grow data economy and, and to reconciling that with fundamental rights. And there I follow Damien that you can perfectly do that by, by setting rules for the participants. I think it's another question, which is not, I, I'm not saying it, it's a good question also, is how do we build up European digital capacities? Mm -hmm. It's a very valid question, but it's a different question. Yeah. And I think, Sometimes you will have to make choices, and I'm not sure that by saying that if we want to grow Europe's digital economy, we shall only have European digital capacities, I'm not sure that will be the best for the European digital growth, but it's a choice you make, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so for me, thank you very much for the interesting panel, I really enjoy it. Um, I have a question regarding uh, business to government data sharing. Um, so I live in the Netherlands and uh, I think it's Mercedes that has an exclusive uh, sort of agreement with the Dutch government to share data. And you've been talking about the scooters all the time, so there's a couple of scooter companies here in town that will probably um, cooperate in some way with the municipality. And so um, to me the notion of sharing is something very different than mm -hmm. gifting, right? If you gift data, um, you know, yeah. you just give it away. But sharing is this relationship where you want something back in a certain way. There's a certain sense of reciprocity. And so I wonder, why do these Mercedes or these Ubers or whichever company you want to uh, name here, why do they want to engage um, in data sharing with municipalities? What's in it for them? Yeah. What's in it for them? Helene, what are they saying? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, and very, very relevant also in this uh, B2G context. Um, yeah, what's in it for them? Uh, what appeared, for instance, from, uh, from some of the interviews is that um, uh, some government, uh, some civil servants said, well, what about quid pro quo? Uh, isn't that a reasonable approach? Because they are collecting uh, data uh, from within the public space. And the public space is from, from everybody. So that's uh, the line of reasoning they have. Um, and well, what is in it for them? I, I think I gave the example, well, uh, you, there are sometimes overlapping interests in data sharing. Um, and that these might perhaps be uh, identified more often. And of course, I uh, understand that some companies uh, have a different um, approach to what data means for them than other companies. And to, be, to give you an example that this is 
unclear um, how that works is that one civil servant even said, well, we do have a bus system running in Amsterdam, but we are not earning money from passengers paying for the bus trip. We earn money from the cameras that are in the bus and the data that is being collected there. So this is a privatized bus company, I have to say. But just to give you an example, so that really gives you a mind change of, oh, so, and what is the interest? The interest for the city would be then, um, are these buses, because the city is also paying for these buses, um, and, and making infrastructure, the, the physical infrastructure for them to drive. So how, how can we create better uh, infrastructure in this, uh, from this perspective? Can I add to this? Uh, for me, this is again an issue of imagination. I'm yeah. hearing sort of a, uh, this, this, I'm imagining a situation where there's a company that collects and owns the data. It's company data. And then the question is, why would they share it? I know it's a question that needs to be answered. These will be business debates. And, but I will try to maybe naively push a different framing. There's a very interesting, by the way, Indian report on non-personal data sharing where they introduce the term community. And it's sort of a hard term to put in here. And they basically say anyone is a community. But I think when you put it in that picture, you realize that data the data in Amsterdam is a community data. Again, it's, 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 not, it's just so happens that it materializes in devices that are privately owned. But I think from the start, we should imagine it as, as, a, as a collective sum of behavior, of expression of behavior of all of us. And the first question is, why should be sh it should be shared with the company? Well, it just so happens, and I have nothing against private businesses yeah. operating all sorts of uh, functions in the city, like transport functions, but it's sort of a, an a no-brainer no and another interesting thing is we accept statistics and business also accepts statistical duties and they don't say what's in it for me or the answer is pretty simple you get back statistics and companies rely on statistics and by the way so maybe I found what I would say to business I would say this is going to be statistics 3.0 <laughs> <laughs> And by the way, if you look for like in the B B two G conversations, really the point of reference is statistics. And I think it feels both a bit outdated and also not a silly one. It's a pretty good model of data sharing that we developed over the last century. Mm. Yeah, it's a very. Can I? Yep. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, come into this because I mean I think this is really a, a crucial question of how do you see uh, yeah data communities, data markets in the future. And uh, I mean, for me, I still have a hard time, you know, solving this bus example with like thinking about community, but I, I have to, you know, get further into it. But if the idea is that the, in the end, the public sector has access to um, people driving on buses, the data about that, I think there are multiple ways to get there. And I yeah. think we still need to argue uh, what the best, uh, you know, what, what the regulatory need is and how we can best regulate sure. it. I mean, that's really what I think the, the, the core task is. And uh, I mean, the approach that the Data Act for me currently takes is more um, to say that the people who are using the bus, if you want it, they should be um, the ones enabled and empowered. And that's also in line with GDPR. And then if they wanted to share this data with the public sector, they, they should be enabled to do that in a way. It's a bit more difficult because this is not a connected device. So the example is not perfect. Yeah? But like from the perspective of who should be able to give the public sector um, the data, I will just take this image. Don't you know, hold me <laughs> accountable to it. But like it should be uh, the, the people who are actually driving uh, or using that bus. Or you could say, look, if the Amsterdam city is actually contracting someone to drive these, uh, you know, to, to, to operate these buses, why don't, doesn't Amsterdam not only write in the contract, OK, you uh, will get X amount of money uh, for driving yeah. these buses, but you will say you get X amount of money. Um, and actually, you will, um, since you benefit from the data as well, get less money because you also get the data. Or uh, you say, like, you will, um, you know, but you have to transfer the data about who's driving, not who, but like maybe, uh, you know, anonymized altogether, um, have to give us the data uh, which we can use for our city planning. So, and I think what we need to be clear about is, what kind of alternative solutions are we proposing when we talk about community data? Um, I mean, what would that actually mean for me to write in a you know amendment in the Legal Act? Or what kind of mm -hmm. other scenarios, if it's not an emergency, 
do we believe are there that would entitle that would need further regulation from the European level to enable the city of Amsterdam to 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 have access to that data? And I'm again I'm in the you know fact finding listening mode to to find that out. But I think we need to be extremely precise on when we regulate such things because they do obviously mm -hmm. impede also on the freedoms of of uh, of contracts. And so we need to need to understand what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Damien. Uh, uh, and just a brief uh, uh, comment to this is uh, what we should not perhaps try for is more legislation, but also look at what is already out there. I mentioned uh, before the fundamental rights, uh, but we also have a lot of uh, things like administrative law that really regulates quite severely uh, on what, uh, in this case, uh, public sector can do, how they can access, under what conditions they can set standards, they can uh, issue licenses or uh, put regulations out. So, uh, or, or conclude contracts uh, with uh, with uh, with businesses. So, uh, it's a complex field. And again, uh, what we discussed before, uh, governance means that you look indeed at these regulatory aspects. You look at the technical aspects. You look at people that are involved. So, it's a socio-technical system, as we used to say in Cambridge, uh, that you are working with. And everything, every aspect, must be dealt with properly and have a proper role, and otherwise the governance might start to leak from the wounds, as uh, Balas always says, and that is where the risks uh, uh, are, are happening. And I think there was a question from... So before yeah. that... Uh, I have a small one, and sorry for my ignorance here, because I'm a little bit more in the uh, industrial <laughs> space, but if, to Damien's point, if you say that um, the data subject is ultimately the decider. How, how are you going to achieve scale? Yeah. Because it, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. This is this, uh, this was my also my question, and I was so happy that we just finally uh, uh, swerved back to the original topic of the uh, the question. Because if I understand correctly, the current approach is that uh, by empowering even more uh, the data subjects or the end users or whoever wears the Fitbit, uh, you uh, expect that companies are gonna start if they haven't started yet compete on. Of, on rights or user rights or, or user interests uh, or community interests maybe, right? Mm -hmm. But that's a strong assumption. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, the involvement of the municipality is a, is a different scale where, where like maybe more, and it's also very uh, important that we are assuming very progressive uh, municipalities here and not like, I'm from Hungary, I'd like not all not all uh, municipalities are super progressive, but uh, but we assume that there is a scale on which you can actually negotiate and just represent collective interests or represent public interests uh, on a level which is uh, uh, even more like has a better resolution than maybe on European or a national scale. And uh, if you don't have those parties, then uh, then it's very difficult to actually achieve. Uh, 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 change and and the 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 parallel that comes to mind was when uh, the uh, German uh, collecting society uh, GEMA uh, blocked the uh, uh, the German content from YouTube because they could right they were in the position to actually say we have to negotiate better deals with you unless you won't have our content and uh, in that sense if there is no similar entity in power to have th that say in vis-a-vis -vis other like major. Uh, players in the data economy, then uh, maybe the, the, the individual approach uh, can achieve that, but maybe, maybe not. Right? Sorry, this is just a bit of a tangent, but it Im immediately makes me think of the Dutch Foundation for Public Code, which basically says you need shared uh, open source uh, municipal solutions. So, um, you know, bureaucratic change doesn't scale easy. Yes, I also come from Poland where well, I don't live in Amsterdam <laughs> and we don't have the Dutch approach to data-driven uh, municipalities. But, but if Amsterdam produce good code, uh, code scales well, mm. right? But that's, I know that that is a bit of a, a utopia. We're not there. I hope we get there, right? Mm. That's the best these advanced uh, municipalities could do uh, to support uh, these data-driven solutions. But sorry, that's probably uh, mm. not for this conference. <laughs> Uh, we need to wrap, wrap up. Uh, sir, you had a question back there. Uh, we have one I session? have the mic, I don't know. Yeah, uh, how many minutes do we have? Five? Do we still have? No, we're over. 
uh, then I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, let's continue this uh, in the break. Uh, thank you for the panelists. Uh, thank you for the remote thank participation. You. Thank you for the audience. Uh, and uh, thank see you, you, Damian. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> for thank you. Remote presence. And thank you, everybody. Absolutely. Thanks a lot.